and I. Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from the museum, which is located on the territories of the Lekwungen, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations in Victoria, British Columbia. And I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. I encourage you all to consider the territories on where you're watching from today and feel free to add your own land acknowledgement to the chat. So I'm very excited uh, for this program today. I've been doing RBCM and RBCM at home since March of 2020. And during that time, I've had the pleasure of speaking with my colleagues here at the museum and from different museums and galleries around the province. And today I'm taking a rare trip outside of the province to chat with two guests at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, which reopened after a two year and three month closure in a new building in June of 2016. Curator of Collections, Steve Hendrickson, and Jackie Manning, Curator of Exhibits, are my guests today. And they're here to talk about their statewide community collaborator program and their in-house exhibits program. Steve and Jackie, welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, I just yeah. wanted to say that the um, uh, over the years since, uh, since when I was a student at Portland State University and then later at the University of Washington, the the uh, British Columbia Provincial Museum, as I knew it then, was one, was my all-time favorite museum, and uh, I spent many hours on the ferry riding back and forth to special exhibits there, and it really uh, piqued my curiosity and interest in becoming a museum worker, and I always, from the day I saw this, the view that you have of the background there of the museum, I always... Uh, uh, aspired to have my own curatorial tower, <laughs> the the uh, the structure, of the S. And uh, in this, uh, I saw an opportunity when we did this construction project here to finally get my own curatorial tower. But it, it, with the budget as it was, I only succeeded in moving up from the basement to the first floor. But that was uh, that's progress. <laughs> So thank you. And I also brought my copy of the legacy here just to acknowledge my friendship with Peter McNair and Alan Hoover, who are, are really great friends. They're retired now, but they, they had a lot of influence on, on my, uh, my uh, up, upbringing in museum work. Well, it's lovely to hear um, that we've inspired museum professionals like yourself um, and inspired you even for, for something like this tower in your new building. And uh, today, I believe you're going to chat a little bit about what that process was like, and in particular, your community curator program. So I think you have some slides ready to share with us. Yes, we do. Go ahead and get that going. All right. This is an image of the new building, the new uh, Andrew P. Cachevera building. And uh, I, we too would like to acknowledge that the Alaska State Library Archives and Museum is located on the unceded land of the Yacht people. The Alaska State Library Archives and Museum acknowledges that Alaska was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose this land and this institution is located. Yeah, uh, this is a, a photograph of uh, one of the Aquan village sites that's located about 17 miles north of present day downtown Juneau. And the, these, they're a division of the Klingit tribe who live roughly from the, the border with British Columbia in the south up to Yakutat Bay along the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, when they started a mine in uh, the downtown Juneau area, uh, many of the people of the village moved their uh, moved houses so that it was just adjacent to the, uh, to the new, um, to the mining area where many of them found employment. 
Now the museum grounds actually uh, sit in what was the water at that time, just offshore. There's a line of of houses along the the top of the beach there. The, those are the Klingit clan houses, and uh, sometime in the early 1900s, that was filled in with mine tailings, and eventually a good part of downtown Juneau was built on tailings that basically cut the Klingit village off from the water. And that's an area, of course, that they uh, really needed access to for transportation and subsistence purposes. And it wasn't uh, exactly um, a, uh, uh, it was kind of forced upon them to uh, make way for that. And our, our uh, museum sits right on top of those those in that intertidal zone out in front of the village. So it's really something that we we needed to recognize in in the construction of the new building. We we really wanted to uh, to talk about that history. The museum uh, was created in 1900, actually, when the capital of Alaska was in Sitka. And uh, in 1912, the capital was moved to Juneau and uh, the museum uh, for the first 20 years was basically a closet in the governor's office where they started collecting artifacts. And eventually in 1919, they, they opened the doors to the public. Father Kashaviroff there on the left was the first paid uh, librarian and curator. And he's responsible for uh, a, uh, collecting a large number of uh, Alaska Native and Russian artifacts for the museum. And he was also the curator of the, or the librarian of the uh, historical library. This is a, a view of the exhibits. We don't have many pictures of them from those days, but one of the things that always impressed me about this photo was the fact that they used chicken wire to enclose the the mammoth skull and tusks there in the center of the floor. We don't use a lot of chicken wire <laughs> anymore in the exhibits. And I, I'm informed that the, the the politically correct term for chicken wire is poultry wire. So <laughs> this is uh, uh, after 1935, approximately, the museum moved up to what is now the Capitol building. and. Uh, so that they were able to spread out a little bit. And in those days, everything we had was on exhibit in one form or another. So things got pretty crowded there after a while. And uh, in 1965, approximately, uh, the museum got a home of its own for the first time a dedicated building was put up. And th this was open in 1968 in honor of the centennial of the Alaska Purchase when uh, Russia sold its uh, business interests to the United States. And uh, that was our home for uh, until about uh, 2013 approximately when we started the new project. And this image, I guess uh, uh, this shows the old building with a portion of the new building under construction in the back. And eventually this entire structure was demolished and part of the new building rests on top of it. Jackie, did you want to take over? Sure. Um, one of the interesting things about this project was on the back side of the old museum, the collections were down in the basement where Steve and I both worked. And um, to move the collections, there was a Connex tunnel that was put into place. So Connex lined up from the old building into this, what you're seeing in the background is uh, where the collection storage is for both the Alaska State Museum on the on the first floor and then the Alaska State Archives and, his, and Historical Library on the second floor. And um, to move those collections, the, the tunnel was put in place and then a hole was put into the old building and everything went directly from the old building into the new uh, into the new vault, and um, so we were able to keep uh, humidity levels, you know, fairly, you know, close to what they needed to be, and, and less damage for the collection. So, uh, outside of a few things that had to go out the front door, uh, most things went through that Connex tunnel. And that that also avoided the the problem with uh, trying to store the collection in some other building in Juneau, which doesn't exist. 
so we were able to figure out how to move the collection directly out of the old building into the new one before the old building was demolished. And it worked out really well. Here's a, an image of the construction site, uh, the new building being put up. You can see beautiful snowy day in Juneau, Alaska, like today. One of the interesting things about the project here was um, once that, once the first portion of the new building was done and the collections were moved, we were we got permission to, special permission, this is very rare, to work on a construction site in that, that new portion that was done, since that housed the collections and we were designing the new exhibits. Um, you're seeing here, this is a photograph of staff wearing hard hats and boots and, and uh, we had rules that we needed to follow to work on a construction site, but we were actually able to work in those uh, in those new vault spaces and um, and follow uh, our our contractors were named PCL and uh, they provided specific training that we had to follow and yes we were able to work on a on a construction site which is very rare. Here's another photo of that um, the old building coming down and and the portion of the new building in the background. So the for the new museum exhibits, the, the layout was determined by um, mostly by large objects in the beginning. So there we have uh, one of the highlights in the collection is watercraft. We've got uh, Umiak, dugout canoe, multiple kayaks, a Bristol Bay double ender. Um, it, in the old museum, there was a a clan house and that was very much wanted to represent Southeast Alaska again and house those collections. Uh, we have a small mining locomotive. So for the, the design of the new exhibits, um, I think it's fair to say it pretty much started with the large objects and placing those on the floor plan and that determined sort of the flow of the new exhibit design and then from there we were able to uh, to get smaller and start looking at uh, smaller cases and, and case designs. The company that did our casework was Zone. Once we got to the smaller case design, um, again, we're still looking at key objects uh, that we knew wanted to go out on exhibit. Um, but once we had case design, we were then able to break it down smaller and uh, work within each case, within each section. And there's about 20 sections in the museum. Here's a, a case being, inspe being inspected by our former deputy director, Bob Banghart. Um, Zone provided one case that came, uh, came to Alaska that we used for layouts and uh, we were able to test it and make some changes and, and uh, determine you know, how, how these would work for us. Uh, our new cases were a major upgrade from the previous cases. Um, Zone worked with uh, uh, worked with the museum on designing cases that had doors that opened for easy access and um, we didn't need to remove large sheets of glass. Since we have many items that go out for ceremonial use, uh, that was a key factor for um, being able to access those. So it was a very good upgrade and a good uh, collaboration between Zone and the museum's needs. Zone is a Canadian firm? Yes, they're yeah. based out of Montreal. So uh, as the exhibits were, um, we were starting to get down to, to case level, uh, the community curation process became a very important part of exhibit design. And I'll let Steve talk about that. Yeah, um, this was a really interesting part of the project that uh, we wanted to um, in spite of how isolated various parts of Alaska are and the, the great distances involved, uh, we wanted to make sure that we fairly represented the, the history and people from all regions. Uh, that's part of our mission is to um, interpret Alaska and its history as a whole, not just Southeast Alaska, even though that's where we're physically located. So we, and we set out to include 
um, voices of uh, as many different um, regions, communities, tribes, um, uh, ethnic groups, uh, cultures as possible. Uh, of course, we're, we're confined somewhat by the nature of our collection. We can't just, uh, we know that we're weak in, in representing uh, some of the cultures and we just didn't have time to launch collecting initiatives to fill in those gaps. Uh, luckily, we've been, we've been working on, working towards this uh, project, even though we, long before we had a project, we knew we were weak in some areas and had plans to try to fill some of those gaps. And over the years, we succeeded in being able to have objects throughout the exhibit covering, um, you know, one of our weak areas is, uh, is what we call foreign voyagers. That's the, the period of European ex exploration since so many of the related objects to that are in European institutions or, or the bottom of the ocean. Uh, we weren't able to um, uh, use a lot of uh, original objects in that section. But a lot of the others we over the years have, have really um, uh, been able to uh, add some really unique objects, very rare, that help tell the story of Alaska. And we don't have any, any real major uh, uh, sections that uh, we had to rely on historical photos, for instance, that would be a way to talk about certain things that we don't have objects for. But since we're a museum and we specialize in three-dimensional objects and artwork, uh, we tried to tell the story as broadly and uh, as, uh, as fully as possible using objects. So uh, we, we set out, uh, I think we had 15 or 20 field trips out to various parts of Alaska to talk, to interview, um, specialists in some of these areas and also to have community meetings where we had public we advertised publicly that we we're doing a presentation on this project and we invited the community to give us input as to what their uh, what they think is important for us to include and it was uh, quite an adventure just getting to some of these places and also due to weather never really knowing when you would come back. <laughs> uh, I think we got stranded in Kodiak for five or six days uh, waiting for the weather to clear. So you, you sometimes we got, so we got a lot of good information from Kodiak. They're just sitting in the airport waiting for our flights, uh, talking to community members. But this is Glenn Simpson. He's a Klingit and Taltan, um, First Nations. Uh, he's also a, a professor of art at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and we uh, we hired um, approximately 25 to 30 individuals to uh, actually write uh, exhibit labels for the exhibit and to in in um, get involved in object selection too. And Glenn was one of them who worked on uh, the Athabascan. Uh, uh, interior uh, Alaska Native section, and also um, the uh, cross cr yeah in the cross cultural area uh, on uh, materials and uh, and use of materials. So and uh, he did a really fine job with that. And oh, uh, but backing up for a minute before, as a result of. Uh, the consultations and working together with our staff, we came up with uh, a um, uh, kind of a, a theme, a mission, uh, and a big idea. Uh, so we were trying to boil this down to some key takeaways that people would get from looking at the exhibits. And one of them was to, to talk about the environment and the people in the environment uh, as as one subject and how how they have the environment and the people have shaped each other going through time and uh, some of the themes uh, uh, people have a lot of misconceptions about Alaska so we're trying to dispel some of those myths uh, talking about um, change and continuity as we are entering into a, a period of change on the planet 
uh, we, we really think back to how uh, Alaska Native peoples have survived several major planetary changes since they were here. And so we looked, how, looked at how they, they did it and what uh, try to derive some lessons from their experience that we can apply to the present day. So we put a lot of time into trying to come up with these objectives for the exhibits. And as a, after the whole thing got done, we actually discovered that there were more, uh, more objectives than we, we initially had. And uh, one of them is uh, talking about technology, how Alaskans have, they have uh, shaped their technology um, based on their unique experience and environment here. And uh, that goes back to 10 to 10,000 plus years ago. And uh, so that's something that came out of it. <clears throat> so there's no way we could really uh, consult widely enough in this process. And even after we actually started doing these trips, we really had to fall back on people that we've been, we've known and been involved with for a long period of time uh, who, who um, provided um, a lot of really uh, awesome lessons for us and things that we could apply to the new museum. Well, some of the more, um, I guess I would say, um, uh, significant relationships that we had is uh, with the Klingit people who live in Southeast Alaska. And the, for many years, we've shared um, ownership or and or use rights with them to objects in the collection. And we're, we're continually <clears throat> uh, removing things from the exhibit to send out to ceremonial use. And so um, this is uh, two clan leaders. Um, the Klingit culture is divided into eagle and raven moieties. And so here's uh, Andy Abona, who's a raven side frog uh, the frog clan, the Kiksuti of Sitka, and Andy Gamble, Eagle Side uh, Wolf House. And they were, uh, this was the last day we were open to the public. We were starting to remove objects from exhibit and they wanted to place their, the objects that they have that were on exhibit, they wanted to place those back in storage and actually spend time talking to the objects and explaining to the spirits what was about to happen and just to properly put these things away for a couple of years during the, uh, in the, the design and installation process for the new museum. The frog hat is we've uh, jointly purchased that with the Klingit tribe from an auction back in the early 80s and we share ownership of it and it, it goes out frequently for ceremonial use and when it's not being used then it comes back to the museum for display and safekeeping. The museums in our old building, the museum spaces were, we had a lot of um, classes. Uh, Selena Paratrovich, uh, Klingit or Haida Weaver, um, who grew up on Haida Gwaii. Uh, she taught classes here. We've had Klingit ceremonies. This is a repatriation ceremony at the museum. So we were hoping to have new, better spaces for some of these activities as well. And one of the, um, the, in the community, we, we, in our consultation meetings with them, we had a, a representation of a Klingit clan house in the old museum that people really loved. And we did programs in there and sometimes ceremonies. And they really wanted to see us have a new version of that, a better and more accurate version. So the, this uh, was a major component of the exhibit design and we, we went to uh, a group of Klingit carvers in Wrangell and had them build this house there and then it was dismantled, shipped up and rebuilt inside the museum. It, it is smaller than the one we had previously mainly because of the pillars that hold up the second floor and uh, even though we were able to get the architects to accommodate some of our, our design aspirations, we weren't able to get them to take out a pillar. <laughs> we tried, but that would add a couple million dollars to the project. So we had to uh, 
um, make it a little bit smaller, but still we were able to make it, it has a really nice feel for it. For small groups, it works really well for interpretive purposes. And around the, the perimeter is the main section where we talk about Alaska natives of Southeast Alaska, and we have contextualized, contextualized exhibits, groupings of objects that uh, help tell about what their culture is all about. So this is a, a getting back to the consultation meetings. We had a series of these meetings all around Alaska with individuals, with museum staff uh, from different communities. This is at Fairbanks talking to the University of Alaska Museum staff there. This is Glenn, uh, Glenn Simpson again, and one of the cases that he helped design. And uh, we have, this is a, a display of, uh, of traditional and introduced materials and objects made from them. So we have uh, uh, cutting tools here with jade or nephrite blades next to ones with um, introduced uh, iron, uh, old worn out files. You can tell some of these blades are made from recycled and repurposed materials. And this talks about copper up here in the the, develop, the metallurgy involved in making ceremonial objects and tools from copper. This is a big lump of jade down here, or yeah, jade and uh, copper nuggets. Uh, but and one of the goals of the exhibit was uh, we wanted to make sure people came away with the knowledge that Alaska natives are not just in the past. And one of the ways that we've done that is in these exhibits, we have um, historic and in some cases ancient objects right next to contemporary ones and obviously this sculpture by Larry Beck it's uh, the head of a walrus made out of a portion of a, a automotive automobile tire a a hubcap and I don't know uh, if if members of the audience will recognize what these blue things are but those are oil can spouts that you used to have to plunge down into the top of an oil can to put oil in your car and he assembled all those together and made a walrus sculpture out of it so and we do this throughout the gallery we have contemporary objects next to historical ones and um, and then that's all explained in the label bar that's down below we have small photos of each object uh, with a little bit of text so they they're able to see that this is 20th century and these other things are, are uh, early 20th century or 19th century or earlier. The only thing for this that we didn't really have to show was a meteorite. There are uh, lots of stories of, of iron tools being made out of meteorites here and uh, we weren't able to, we don't have one in our own collection. But uh, we even had uh, meetings on people's kitchen tables. This is a a native artist uh, in Kodiak. And so we, we really, um, you know, we went for, we, we didn't just do groups. We got most of our, the best information came from talking one-on-one -on -one to people. And it was a major effort to do that, but we really thought it was necessary. The people from all over the state supported our budget uh, initiatives to build this new, new museum in Juneau. And a lot of the folks in Alaska have never even been to Juneau and don't have any plans to go here. So it's, it was really important for us to come out there and give people an opportunity to see what we were going to be working on. This is a, uh, the curator of the Kerry McLean Museum in Nome. And uh, our co-curators, we call them, these are specialists, either uh, tribal historians or um, non-native specialists in various areas. We got them to work with our collection and come up with some really world-class, meaningful exhibits, very object intensive. You can see this display of alley basketry is, has a lot going on there. And each one of these, uh, Ray Hudson, he lives in, uh, I think New Hampshire now, but he, he lived in Unalaska for many, many years and developed an expertise in uh, in Aleut Unangik bas baskets. This is made from uh, grass uh, is the primary material with dyed grass and sometimes silk and wool that's uh, woven in. And um, 
he he made a really great display of the different types of baskets and different design motifs and and uh, we had a lot of a lot of these are identified as to the maker so it was a chance to showcase the work of named artists and these are uh, mo mostly 19th and 20th century baskets put together but there were uh, one of some of the hardest decisions we had to make were for objects like the basket on the right that was made by an Elliot woman, Mary Sniggeroff, in the 1940s. And uh, this was part of the Elliot relocation during World War II. The, the uh, military ordered uh, all Americans out of the Aleutian chain because of the fighting with the Japanese. It was considered a war zone and they evacuated a, a whole villages up there and they didn't really have housing for them. So they found uh, a decommissioned cannery buildings in Southeast Alaska and sent them uh, down to live in Southeast Alaska for, um, for the war, during the war. And they didn't have any source of income. A lot of their, they couldn't bring their uh, tools and materials with them. So they collected the weavers there to make a few dollars during that, this period. They collected local grass and made some baskets and were able to sell those to curio shops in Alaska. And this one was made in Killisnew in Southeast Alaska by an Elliott woman who was interned there, interred there during the war. And so we have, uh, we have several of her baskets. We ended up putting some of these in the World War II section because it was really the only object that we have in the museum that relates to the relocation. And that's that's was a, a really a disgraceful period. Not so much that they were trying to evacuate people out of harm's way, but in the process, the housing that they had for them was so horrible that many of them died of of pneumonia and illnesses that they contracted living in these uh, dilapidated buildings in Southeast. And while they were home, while they were down in Southeast, a lot of their their villages and property was stolen or bulldozed by the military who wanted to deprive the Japanese of, of uh, places to live or assets to capture. They just bulldozed the houses. And so the, a lot of the people never went back to their homes after this. Uh, we, we have a long um, relationship with various scholars and First Nations uh, people. Dolores Churchill is a renowned Haida Weaver, who grew up on Haida Gwaii, and she she provided a lot of input into the display of, of baskets and ceremonial textiles. Our labels uh, for these, we, um, you know, labels uh, are an ever-evolving uh, thing in that frequently you um, learn new things about objects as a result of them being on display, and we try to get updates to the label done periodically. I guess one thing that I, I wish we had been able to do is find a, a way to be able to reprint labels ourselves in-house, but the technique that they use for printing is something that only certain print shops are able to do. So we have to go out to contract every time we want to change a label, which you know over time it, it, it adds to the cost of them. We used to be able to just print them in-house and change them frequently but um, on the and these are a couple of examples of things that uh, we would like to change at some point maybe on the left is a dentalium headdress a clinget headdress and this one is on display and when i was uh, when we were doing labels for alaska native material we would always try to have the name of the object first in the labels in the language of the people that created it. And I was having a really hard time trying to find the Klingit term for beaded headdress or dentalium headdress. And so I asked uh, a friend of mine who's a, a speaker of Klingit if he knew what it was. And uh, I said, Harold, do you, what's the Klingit term for dentalium headdress? And he he just sent emailed back a, a phrase in Klingit, and I said, "Oh, great! I've been looking for this for a long time." So I inserted it in the label, and then maybe a year later, <laughs> after the label was printed and the exhibit was up, I was back in there with a, a young man who's learning Klingit, and he was—he's related to the woman who made this headdress, and he was looking at the label, 
and he just started laughing uncontrollably. And at that moment, I realized that I had been, I'd been punked, as they say. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, what my friend Harold gave me as the term for this means I don't know in Klingit. <laughs> So um, that one, <clears throat> I've, uh, we've left it in place, though, because at the time, we really didn't know what the term was. At some point, we'll probably get around to changing that. So on the, on the right is uh, an American flag that came to us as the first flag, first American flag raised over Alaska following the transfer uh, from, the, from Russia. And uh, in the exhibit, we put it in there as, you know, we, we don't have, didn't have conclusive proof to verify that, but we associated it with the flag raising ceremony that took place in Sitka in October 1867, because the U.S. State Department had this flag. They gave it to us and said it was the first flag raised over Alaska. But it turns out that it was uh, uh, more, uh, <clears throat> more, most probably the first American flag raised in Alaska was before it was officially part of the United States. There was a, uh, a uh, the Western Union was laying a, 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 a telegraph cable that would go from North America to, to Europe via Russia, and they'd cross the Bering Strait with a, an undersea cable. And they, this, uh, this expedition was, uh, launched by an American company and they carried their own American flag with them a couple of years before the actual transfer of Alaska. So we, this is new information that we would like to include. And I initially, when I heard that there's, there was some new information about this, I, I was moaning because uh, it was so, uh, this case was all designed for this flag and it's a pretty large flag and moving it somewhere else would require that we'd have to take off display about 20 objects probably. But luckily we can still keep it in the same case. We just have to change the label eventually. So it, it really makes sense to try to plan for things to change as much as possible. We already talked about how because of ceremonial use, we have to get in and out some cases quite a bit and we those particular cases we designed and laid out in a way that it would facilitate removal of the object uh, sometimes on short notice oops uh, yeah this is a we have on the on the right a quons a, a representation of a quonset had a it's a, a a an ikea type structure that the military put up uh, thousands of these around Alaska during World War II uh, to house uh, their troops during World War II. This is our World War II section. We actually found an original Quonset hut that was uh, built during World War II and, and purchased it. And, and in the process of starting to take it apart, somebody thought, well, maybe we should have the, the paint on this tested to make sure it didn't have hazardous chemicals. And sure enough, it was lead paint. So we had to abandon the idea of using a, a real Quonset hut, and we instead built a, a mock-up of it. But it, it kind of harkens back again to the British Columbia Provincial Museums and their, the way they've contextualized their exhibits into structures. And, and in here, this is a little theater area that we show newsreel footage of the war. And we made a seating in there that's a representation of the of the portable beds that they used to have in there. And we have a screen door uh, in the back. And so it kind of gives you the feel of what it was like to spend some time in a Quonset hut. But for the exhibit, we, we did find some gaps in the collection. We wanted to have a representation of the allied forces that were active in Alaska, both Canadian and American. And we wanted to have uniforms representing the different uh, branches of service, Army, Navy, U.S. Army, Air Corps, Coast Guard, and Marines. And we, we tried hard to find a, a Canadian uniform that actually had um, provenance to the war in Alaska, and we weren't able to do that yet, but hopefully we'll be able to insert this at some point later on. And we did do some, some new collecting for that. This 
this uh, mannequin here of the a U.S. Army Air Corps member was something that kind of came together pretty quickly to, to at least cover that um, area. We have a lot of veterans and families of veterans here, and it would be really important for them to see their branch of the military represented here. Uh, so we, we tried to accommodate that as much as we possibly could. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Jackie now for talking about the layout process and, and uh, development. So with uh, you know, the help of community curators, our curator Steve, uh, we started what we called physical layouts. So we had our case designs. And from those case designs, we had, uh, you know, mock-ups of the dimensions of each section. And so we would um, pull objects that were designed for each section, look at the subgroups that were needed, and do what we called physical layouts. On here, this is in one of the actual mock-up cases. So we were able to use that. Uh, look at label design, see um, see how we could work with label, different types of furniture, risers. Sometimes we just put down brown pieces of paper or tape and, and laid out our uh, the dimensions of where, where things were going to go. From these physical layouts, um, we, uh, we decided a, a lot of things or planned for a lot of things. So this is on the left is our Conservator, Alan Carley, Mount Maker, Aaron Elmore, and uh, myself there, and I'm sure Steve's the one taking the photograph. Uh, so we are talking about uh, conservation concerns, uh, mountain making, what we can do, where different mounts can, uh, where things could be attached, and uh, and how these displays are going to look. We would then photograph and measure all of the objects, and then we we took that information and we created digital layouts. Um, here's uh, one of the cross-cultural sections that Steve talked about earlier. And uh, and so we had photographs of each object. So uh, we had that reference. And then we also did a silhouette that included information like our object numbers and just uh, lists of, of information, which you'll see a little bit more on here coming up. Steve talked a little bit about labels. Um, we we have a label design. Uh, there was hopes to have you know these labels be digital and easily updated, and we just weren't there yet uh, with technology, and and that would have been great. Um, so we have uh, label design was decided on on what we could what we could accommodate, and um, and with that. Uh, as he mentioned, there's uh, photo IDs, and that we then, once we decided on, you know, how the labels, where they were going to be, and, and the label design, we put that into our uh, into our digital layout, so we could try to anticipate um, any any sort of views that would be blocked, objects that would be blocked, and uh, and look at it as a whole. Here's the section of the elutic section some objects in there so on the top we have from these digital layouts we it produced uh all sorts of information for us uh, it gave us the mountain design risers furniture what needed to be framed um, reproductions props and um our conservator would would reference these, our mount makers would reference these. They were uh, very valuable case back images. Uh, everything kind of, this was our, this was a guide, a uh, guide for labels as well. Um, so these digital layouts uh, kept, sort of designated all the jobs that were, uh, that were gonna come from, from each of these sections. Here's another one for the, Kayak display, we have four kayaks, a comparative kayak display uh, in the museum. Here's uh, Paul Gardnier. He is, uh, he worked on the project. And I just, uh, one of the amazing things I would say about this project was I had started at the museum and, oh, was a few years in to the old 
museum before this project began. And, um, but many of the staff had been on staff for 20, 25, 30 years, including Paul, who had been the exhibit designer for 20 years. And he retired and came back to consult and help with, uh, help with this project, with doing the major design of the exhibits. And then he also took on uh, mount making for all the large objects that were needed. So what an incredible resource to have had so many staff that, um, that came with that knowledge of many years with the museums and with the museum and, and all and ideas of what could be improved. It was, um, I thought that was just invaluable. Here's a display of those kayaks now, how they look on exhibit in the museum. I'm gonna quickly talk about planning. Um, the contractors for this project, the PCL, had a system called poll planning. And poll planning, you can see all these stickies here. They're, this is a very small portion, but um, they used this with all their subcontractors as a way of organizing things by milestones. And they actually start from, uh, from the end goal and work back to a start date. And all the people at impact and what needs to be done before something else can be done. And, and it's a pretty involved system. They educated the museum staff on this because we um, we were the ones that were managing the design and uh, managing multiple contractors ourselves, subcontractors for this project. So poll planning is uh, is a system that we use to to keep track of of all of the jobs that were associated. Many many lists, many Excel spreadsheets. Um, there was a, a lot to keep track of, more than I think I could have even anticipated. Um, so here's just a few few of those lists that we were uh, generating every day. Um, with those plans, here's Paul again, uh, you know, checking. We were working on in this construction site. Things were starting to get placed. We had um, designed things, double checking. There was, we have subfloor heating and so uh, inserts that were put in. There was a lot of concern about things just being just right. A couple inches out could have been made or break uh, being able to see them with case design. And uh, this is the floor plan for the exhibits, which uh, this specific map right here designates our, um, our schedule for install. We were working uh, things as things got pinched. We were working right as cases were going up. We were installing in the case work and the zone was installing cases uh, in other sections. So as they finished each case and that was fully installed, we were right behind them uh, installing objects to meet our install date. There were a couple incredible, uh, you know, other incredible collaborations that we had on this project. Um, we worked with conservation specialists, um, museum employees from all over the state and mount makers. And um, it, it was a pretty incredible collaboration. One of the one of the projects that our former curator of statewide services there on the right, Scott Carley, organized was this uh, program called EXOS, where museum professionals from all over Alaska came at different times to help us pack up the old museum and uh, with that, he wrote a grant to, to be able to bring them here. And they brought their specialty skills, taught our staff um, there on the left there, Rex with the long beard. Uh, he's uh, one of the exhibit technicians from the Anchorage Museum and specializes in working with large objects and displaying and moving large objects. So he's, he's teaching us there how to uh, move that heavy um, totem with a gantry and then also uh, uh, our museum staff was uh, was teaching people you know all sorts of hand skills on on uh, preparing uh, on pulling down objects and, and uh, making housing 
for them while they were stored. So it was this. It was a pretty neat program, this EXO program, and um, and we we made friends with uh, and you know now have these contacts all over the state, which uh, has just been wonderfully helpful since this project uh, ended. Here we are working with Mount Makers. Uh, we the Mount Making project happened. Uh, on site, so right there, we're in the vault and right connected to the to the exhibit storage. Uh, very nearby is the exhibit shop. We have a, a metal shop and a wood shop and a um, and so we were mount making was happening very nearby the objects, and we trained up mount makers locally who have uh, since worked around the state, and we also brought in uh, mount making specialists to train us and and hone our skills and in uh, specific things. Here's just some fun mounts that were made along the way. One of the cases we have, we call it the Wonder Wall displays uh, uh, a lot of our natural history specimens, anim uh, mostly animals, um, and there's the the planning some of the mounts that were made for the bird display and the installation of that. This started off site and uh, and then moved into the museum. Oh, here's some other uh, specialists we worked with that um, we had a, a welder here who, who recreated or he created the the base for our lighthouse lens based off of blueprints that we had. And then we had two Coast Guard specialists that work with um, moving and repairing uh, lighthouse, these Fresnel lighthouse lenses, and that's Joe Cocking and Nick Johnston and our former curator of statewide services, and he was a trained conservator, Scott Carley, helping them. They had to make, uh, we had some missing pieces that they made to, um, to put that back together, so they helped us take it down from the old building and then reinstall it in the new building. The EXO program um, not only involved packing up the old museum, but also uh, it involved we uh, a mount making workshop and helping with all of the mannequins needed for the new exhibits. We have 60 some mannequins or mannequin parts, you know, uh, torsos or uh, different things. And so uh, a workshop was put together to train people in, in making conservation approved mannequins. There's a textile conservator there on the right, Sarah Owens. Uh, helping with that process, and um, and then again, that skill set, uh, folks could take it back to their to their museums. Uh, woman here on the left, Gina Louise. Uh, we have a one of the very popular objects in the old museum was an eagle tree, and uh, we wanted that back. That was that was uh, publicly demanded that uh, it was popular and people wanted to see it in the new new space. So, so it was a it's an eagle nesting tree it's a a tree with a a bald eagle nest with uh, mounted eagles perching on the sides of it and this woman the old tree was an actual real tree but um had asbestos below and had been you know fire sprayed and it, it we couldn't save that tree so this woman here on the left specializes in making trees for museums and uh and zoos uh, similar requirements. So Gina Louise made our new tree, which had a steel post. It got flown in before the ceiling was put on the new building, and then she came uh, came to Juno to install the nest and the branches and stuff. And here it is on the right. You can see it. Uh, there's a nest, and and uh, the eagles are um, all in place. One other. Uh, I just put this in for. For fun, the last object to come out of the old museum was in this very large umiak that uh, is now on display in the new museum. The doors had to come off the front of the museum to get it out. It was picked. Uh, uh, it was, you know, mounted to be able to be picked by the crane that was on site, lifted from the old museum around to the loading dock of the new space and uh and so that was quite a day when an umiak flew flew over 
the, over the building and uh, landed at the back loading dock and uh, was the first thing to go out because things were, were uh, cases were built around it and there it is on display in the new building. And uh, my, my last slide here uh, is like one of the other large objects that went in, the um, uh, Bristol Bay Double Ender. On the far left over here, we've got Louis Bartos, who was a famous sailmaker from Ketchikan, and he made this, the sail, the exhibit. It's a prop uh, sail that was put up on this Bristol Bay Double Ender, and we've got uh, uh, Paul Garnier and Scott Curley here helping install that sail, which um, the roof even has a, the ceiling there is lifted above to, to display that. And that is, um, that's all we have as far as uh, presentation slides. And um, I have a few additional pictures of, of the museum uh, as it is now, but if there's questions, we could uh, stop and open it up for questions as well. Sure, there's just a couple of comments uh, so far that I want to share. Indy on Facebook was saying, um, it's su so surprising to see, amazing really, to see how similar our museum histories are from our locations on indigenous village sites to relationships with government. And I'd add even the tunnel between buildings that you have, like there was so much as I'm listening in our time frame as well, uh, in terms of our buildings and origins. It's, it's really remarkable how similar that is. Katie on Facebook said uh, she is loving this tour and your notes about what worked well and what you would do differently. So thanks for sharing that. It's really uh, so great to hear about uh, those tips about what you might do differently another time. Uh, and yeah, I, I've, I've got a, I have one question for you. So maybe we'll get you to, if you want to hit stop share so we can, oh, beautiful. Love to see that. It's gorgeous. I took the clan house. This has been just such a generous presentation. Uh, I feel like I've had a masterclass uh, <laughs> at, at a conference. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I'm curious, I wanted to ask about the, communi the community consultation program. And I, I like how there's this parallel, you had the community curation program and you've had like a museum collaboration program as well with many other partners. I'm wondering how your community curation program, how has it changed since you've opened in 2016? Well, uh, we haven't, um, uh, I guess uh, we, uh, we have um, revamped it a bit and employed it in our temp in developing temporary exhibits. Uh, we have, we have two, uh, three actual, actually, uh, three temporary exhibits for three gallery spaces for temporary exhibits. So we have a continual uh, rotation of, of uh, temporary shows here. And uh, we more frequently now employ um, uh, guest curators and co-curators who, who would work with me on uh, or other staff members on developing new exhibits and developing the programming for them. We fall back on a lot of the contacts that we made for the for the big project. Um, a lot of them we knew before, but many of them were new to us on that project. And so we have our Rolodex has expanded significantly um, on uh, being able to call in uh, outside expertise. And I guess the the problem uh, with that, though, it, under normal circumstances, we we have very little money to work with to hire consultants and pay for travel and that sort of thing. So we have, we're always uh, uh, trying to struggle with that. The Friends uh, group, uh, we're, it's a, a uh, private nonprofit uh, organization that works with the museum. Uh, we can get funding from them for special projects sometimes and also other, other grants, but we don't have a budget line set up for doing this. So it's always a challenge to find uh, the the financial end of things to give give uh, consultants what they really deserve to bring in their expertise and I, I I hate to say it but for for many years we've we've got all got by with our good relationship with people and that they want to be a part of what we're doing they see the value in it and so many times they just offer their expertise freely to us and we're not in a position to 
to decline that that kind of uh, offer. So a lot of it is volu volunteered uh, services. Mm, yeah, but as you say, it's so important to, to pay for that expertise when, when, when able. Um, Jackie, I'm curious, what has been the public's response? I, I'm wondering, I'm curious first, what was their response when you said you were gonna close the museum and since you've reopened? Well, the, um, the old museum had uh, lots of issues. There were uh, leaks and the, um, and this new building also houses the state archives and state library and historical library. And, and the state archives building ha also had leaks. So um, to be able to, uh, to house these, the collections in a better building was I think well received and appreciated. Um, there was uh, with lots of public meetings uh, prior to the, uh, I think the architects came and presented different designs and, and public meetings uh, talking about that. And those were well attended and, and uh, there were, you know, definitely uh, people were, there were people that were uh, wanted to see some things that were well loved uh, from the old museum carried over and, um, and, so far, I would say the response to the, you know, we had an incredible opening in 2016, uh, well attended. Um, uh, a lot of the, um, you know, one of the spaces, the children's spaces is now uh, ADA accessible and um, that's just been so well received within the community. And I, I think it's uh, mostly been a positive response. You know, there's, um, uh, as Steve said, with labels, things are uh, always evolving, and um, and I'd say one piece of inform or advice that was given to me, and um, I, I would carry on. Uh, I went and visited uh, the Fairbanks Museum before this project started, and talked with their exhibit di designer up there, Steve Boutet, and and he had told me right as they had finished a, a redesign of their major galleries, he said, "Anything you don't finish before opening date." becomes very, very difficult to finish after. And um, we were driven to, to complete by a, a date that um, that we would open and, and our it did not, although we were prepared for opening and, and you know all the sections were done, the, the to-do list was still long uh, to complete out different uh, projects. And, um, and as Steve had said, it became, very difficult to do, you know, back to job as normal and and uh, to continue to complete out those sections, but we are taking them off as, uh, as we can, so. Wow. Yeah, I, I would just add that on, on the interpretive side of things, uh, uh, as we got into the consultation process, we, we realized right away that a lot of the, the aspects of history that we were covering are, are really unsettled as far as in as a historical um, uh, historical episodes, there there's a lot of different perspectives on them, and a lot of the advice that we got from the field was contradictory in what we should focus on and what angle we should uh, we should take on things. And um, uh, for a while, we we felt like you know our goal for the exhibit is to make everybody hate us equally because there is no real way to do everything that everybody wanted either because of budget or just because it was contradictory. And we decided early on to really not, uh, uh, whenever possible, if it was uh, unsettled to not have an official uh, line from the state of Alaska saying what the answer was, we would present more of the different sides of, of things and let people sort it out. And if uh, and we did get a few complaints from people who thought we were taking sides, and and we had um, a lot of evidence showing that our process did equally consider other factors, and so we we thought that overall um, it was very balanced. Even though I think some some uh, 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 industries think that we may have hit them too hard, we actually just presented another perspective on what they were doing they had we had their perspective and and we also showed 
uh, the outcome of their activities and environmental damage and cultural damage and so forth. And they just didn't want us to, we want, they wanted that, us to gloss over that. Uh, so all in all, I think that, that people uh, do, do appreciate that we brought in a lot of different perspectives on things. And um, they, uh, a lot of the people that have come to Juno to see the exhibit and I've gotten a chance to talk to them really felt like their voices were heard and that we did make an effort, even though, um, you know, we don't have all the resources to tell all of these stories adequately, that they appreciate the effort that we made to, to do that. And that people really recognize themselves in the exhibit. It wasn't something that a historian or curator from on high was dictating and telling people what, what the meaning was. It was the, the people themselves telling it. And in many cases we had, um, in most cases, we had Alaska Native people themselves writing about their culture. And I remember one person was complaining that uh, the labels, you know, were written by some curator somewhere and they don't know what our culture is like and all that. And we looked to see and sure enough, it was a, a member of that tribe that actually wrote the labels. So it's, uh, you know, as a way of of showing that we're we're taking that uh, taking it seriously that people should be able to tell their own stories and have their own perspectives in it. I think we we did a pretty good job with it. Not to say it's perfect, but it is a big step towards decolonization. I think is to to make sure those perspectives are included. Yes, thank you. Well said. Well, congratulations on a huge project. And again, thank you so much for sharing, um, sharing that experience and so many ideas and suggestions uh, that can be considered. If folks, if you've joined us late or you missed something and wanna go back, this has been recorded and you'll find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please do have a look there. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to Jackie and Steve. Uh, and hopefully, um, if you want to stay uh, up to date on upcoming events and programs like this one, uh, please do sign up for our e-newsletter. And you can find that at rbcm.ca, and you'll get more information there to find out more. Thank you. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.